So good morning. Uh, wasn't it a fantastic day yesterday? A great, uh, great program of talks. And I was uh, walking in this morning and I thought, oh no, I'm going to speak in front of Jeremy Freeth. It's like playing the guitar in front of the Beatles for me, this is. So, uh, so uh, hopefully, uh, hopefully I'll kind of... Oh! It's just a bit quiet. I'm not, so it should be okay. Then. Okay, so uh, down to business. So um, my name is Vernon Gale. I'm uh, from the University of Edinburgh, and this, uh, my colleague Roxanne Connolly um, has co-authored the paper. Uh, she's sitting here in the front, and we're going to talk about a paper uh, which was entitled "Social Class Inequalities in General Cognitive Ability," and this is really the reflection on a transparent and reproducible sociological study. So just some preliminary uh, things. I said I'm from the University of Edinburgh. This is our fair city uh, in time lapse if you ever uh, come and visit us. And I can actually spare some time because one of the points I was going to make, what we were going to make, is that the idea of reproducible science has, has a kind of long uh, genus. Uh, and obviously twice yesterday we saw this Feynman quote, so we need not go through it again. But really, this idea here of utter honesty is one of the things that is kind of one of the themes that's emerging from yesterday, as it were. So where did we start? Well, we had a, a hackathon, uh, a one-day hackathon, um, a couple of summers ago. And one of the things that came out was, there's a whole gang of us there, is that Roxanne and I said we thought we wanted to, the next paper we wrote, we wanted to see if we could make it completely transparent and completely reproducible and you know, write a decent paper that gets in a kind of decent or top flight journal. So that was the sort of ambition. We were really just, it was a straightforward assay, a sort of acid test. Could we genuinely do this stuff? We'd spent all day talking about it. You know, it was now show me the money time, if you like. And by complete and utter coincidence, uh, this paper came out yesterday. We just got the email <laughs> yesterday. But it's been in sort of uh, preprint, uh, sort of not, um, online first for, for uh, since the back end of, of uh, 2017. So the paper got published in the British Journal of Sociology. You know, I would say it's quite a prestigious journal. Um, but we don't want to talk about the paper at all today. What we really want to talk about are these supplementary materials. And particularly, uh, to our knowledge, this is the first, um, uh, the first that we know of, at least, sociolo sociological paper that has been completely made reproducible within a Jupyter Notebook framework. So there may be others, but this is a, we think this is the first one that we, we know of um, published in that sort of way. Um, so that it's really that bit I'm going to focus on in the uh, remainder of the talk. So the research itself, I'll just mention, just so that, you know, just to give you a flavor of it more than anything else, we're interested in, uh, people may know, especially the psychologists will know the Flynn effect, so Flynn's the sort of big name in this area. And Flynn has really made a sort of clarion call for people to move outside the narrow confines of psychology and start to bring sort of sociological thinking in terms of understanding things like um, childhood uh, cognitive inequalities. So that's really what motivated the work initially. Um, our interest really was, were social class inequalities in general cognitive ability tests and were these changing over time and we investigated this by using two large-scale British birth cohort studies. Uh, the first cohort were babies born in 1958. The second cohort were babies born in 1970. And we were undertaking more or less a, a straight comparison of these, um, these two birth cohorts. And I'll just show one result. So yeah, we see this sort of result. But really, today, the results are unimportant. What I want to talk about is the process of making this work transparent and some of our reflections on that. So using the Jupyter Notebooks, how many Jupyter users are there? How many people would kind of like to be? Yeah? How many people have never heard of Jupyter? Okay, so there's a real kind of mixture of people. So Jupyter Notebooks, they're, they're gaining traction in science. Um, the LIGO collaboration, the guys who won the Nobel Prize for physics, not this time, the time before, um, all of their materials, you know, when the two black holes collide, uh, the gravitational wave, that, that uh, study, that was fully reproducible in the Jupyter Notebook. You can go to the site, you can download it, you can run the simulations. Uh, I've tried it, I can't make head or tail of what's going on, because it's obviously Nobel Prize winning physics, 
but you can do it, and it's completely reproducible. Um, so, the Jupyter Notebook, it's an open source web-based application. If anyone's interested, if they send me an email, I've got a 10-minute introduction to using it in social science, a video um, that you can watch as well. It has sort of three elements, really. The first is live code. So you can actually you do your work in there just like you would in your do file or your R script or um, you know, your SPSS syntax file. Um, and it runs a series of kernels. So at the, I think at the moment you can run about 70 different languages inside the Jupyter Notebook. It's known as being language agnostic. That's the, the phrase that's used. I've heard computer scientists call this uh, the swivel chair. So the idea is that you're at your computer and you're sitting at a swivel chair and you can switch from R and you can switch to Python and you can switch to Julia. Uh, so it always sounds like you're in some sort of 1970s glam rock band with several synthesizers at once. So I think that's a nicer image than the, the swivel chair. So you can work in the, the software or the language that you're, you're uh, interested, your, your own sort of um, preferred language or the one that's required in some way. Um, so you work, there's the live code, there's the live code, there's also the data analysis output, so modeling results, plots, and so on. And finally, documentation, so the, the descriptions you write, the co commenting, and so on, detailing the workflow. So, alongside this paper is a full Jupyter notebook with the paper written in it. So you can, go to, you can go to it now, I'll give you the link, you can go to it, you can look at it, there's the whole of the standard written paper that's in the BJS, but the complete workflow from downloading the data right down through every recode, every kind of um, delete, you know, every plot, every model result, right down to the final kind of archiving. So the complete workflow is preserved within the Jupyter Notebook. And if you look at the notebook carefully, you'll see this is a sort of structure. We start an introduction, go right through you know, all these different things, preparing the first data set, preparing the second data set, the test scores, missing data, how we've made it reproducible, the descriptive results, the modeling results and conclusions, notes, and write down the whole, the whole shooting match is in the, the notebook. Uh, so, what do you actually get in the notebook? Well, if you look at the first, the first uh, thing I'll show, this is a cell, and it'd be familiar to Stata users, this is just a bit of work here, a regression of ability on gender and a bunch of other things. Um, there, so you get that's a code, that's a cell with code in it, and that will be run, which then gives you the output, the raw output inside the notebook. But of course, in our notebook, we've got as well the sort of publication ready version of the whole thing. So you really are looking at the complete workflow and the paper sort of woven uh, together. Uh, we've also got comments, so for us, we've got comments about things we're doing. This is a nice one. This is a perfect match between this variable in the data and the version coded by it. So the, the, the sort of standard comment that you'd put in your workflow. But we've also got more formal ones here, like, you know, we convert this, blah, blah, blah. This is the reference we use. This builds on a method by blah, 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 blah. So a much more kind of, you know, fuller an annotation. So that's some of the things we've done. I'm going to crack on because I know time's short. We, nobody mentioned literate programming uh, yesterday, and I think it's something worth, um, worth talking about. Don Knuth, is, is, um, uh, the Stanford folks will know him. Um, basically, Don Knuth had this idea of a programming paradigm where, there, where computer code is written for humans, not just computers. And yesterday, I used the analogy tonight of um, it being very difficult. If you gave someone a menu from a restaurant and said, could you cook these meals, it would be near impossible for them to do. You could then make them a cookbook, but depending on the level of detail and their level of skill, it might be very difficult for them to cook it. So it's really kind of the cookbook. How are you going to communicate what you've done to somebody, and can they do it again? And if we think outside of social science, it would be really bizarre, wouldn't it, if you went to a restaurant and you asked for your favorite dish and they said, oh, that chef's off tonight. We can't actually cook it. It would be really weird. Or if you, if you said to your mate who was in a band, could you play that track again? And he said, well, no, we've got no note of it. You know, or you know, a symphony orchestra, they go, can't, we can't play Beethoven's Fifth anymore because we've got no way of, you know. So there are many things in life where we're used to kind of incredible detail to help us reproduce stuff. And the kind of weaving, Knuth is big on the kind of weaving of things together. So the process of generating a comprehensive document with a program and its maintenance, so bringing all this together. So I haven't got a huge amount of time, but I'll tell you a bit more about some of the things we did. 
One of the things we did was pair programming, and we got this from computer science. So we actually did the work by one person sitting in front of the machine and the other person standing behind them and checking what they did. And we've never done that before, and it's an interesting exercise. You should at least give it a go once, very useful. As well as that, we use code pair review, which also comes from computer science. Are there some soccer fans? Uh, if you, no, there must be one or two. Um, if you're from lower division, yeah, if you're from lower division Scottish football, uh, you know, the sort of football I watch, you sometimes call it one fella on the ball, one fella off the ball. Okay, so quite often the idea is that just lay the ball off to the other guy, because once you've done that, you're free to have a look around. Okay, so it's that sort of idea. We also did code pair review, where we, we undertook the pair programming, then we both went away separately to two di actually two different countries, England and Scotland, it does, doesn't have to be that, but two different universities, two different computer setups, two different software setups, to see if we could do it all again. Yeah? And that was actually quite instructive, because we found two cases adrift in the data. And I can tell you about those in just a second. Here's a banana skin, and there's a couple of people from data archives. The UK data archive, at least, don't provide, don't provide any version controlling for software release. And that's when we noticed we had data sets downloaded at two different times, and one had been repaired somewhere in the archive, and there were two extra cases. So the best you can probably do is share very detailed information about when the data were downloaded and some sort of way of kind of ar archiving doing that. And this is sort of one of the things I'm talking to the UK Data Archive about. Um, one of the banana skins that we can remove is that, you know, in this, there's a, in this example, but in many examples, there's, there'll be ver very valuable components of code that are made public. So time and time again, we're used to seeing things like social class measures or psychological scales or whatever, where the author has constructed something, but you've got no way into it. And so, you know, this is, this is something that's going to be very good. So, getting towards the end now. So, some reflections. Some of you will know Robin Samuel at the University of Luxembourg. We were telling him about this work, and he used a fantastic phrase. He said, but uh, you guys are doing research with your trousers down. Yeah, this is a very unusual view of, we weren't actually doing that, I assure you. Um, but, the, you know, he had the idea that this is really making things as open as possible. If you're going to show your whole workflow in a Jupyter notebook, it is really make, you know, making yourself naked. Um, there are obvious benefits, and we talked about a lot of them yesterday. So transparency, the ability to duplicate original results, and then replications particularly, and I would say, probably like Nicole Jantz um, would say, that for me, a replication is partly either new data or a new measure or a new technique or some sort of combination of all three of these. So that's how I tend to see a replication as moving forward from a duplication. And I think, actually, uh, sort of 25 years into this job, this is probably my first genuinely peer-reviewed publication. I think it's the only publication to date where a reviewer could actually see what I'd done right to a very detailed level. So um, I'd like to think all the ones up till now have a huge amount of quality um, <laughs> and uh, no errors or problems. But yeah, this one, I'm really confident that it was genuinely peer-reviewed. People, or at least genuinely gave the opportunity for the reviewers to do as, uh, as open and frank a review as possible. Um, was it harder work? Well, yes and no. And I'll probably take a question on that. Yeah. So I think it probably felt like harder work before we did it, but on reflection, maybe it wasn't quite as hard work as we thought. It does require that you reorientate your workflow, and you've got to have kind of willing co-authors to do this kind of stuff. Yeah? And I know this is going to cause a problem here. You know, some PhD students particularly, you might be writing with a more senior person, and you want to kind of make things more open and transparent, but they could be quite blocking. Um, when I've talked about transparency and uh, reproducible research and these sorts of issues in the past, not here, but elsewhere, the room normally splits into two at the end. And it's a sort of split absolutely on age lines. So the more senior people think this is all a bad idea and have 101 reasons why you can't do it, and the more junior people, the earlier career people, think it's a good idea. And I, you know, I don't think, obviously that's not going to happen today, but people have probably experienced the same sort of thing. Um, I think it's a small step for many people, though. Because there'll be loads of people in this room and elsewhere who have fantastically well worked up workflows. They have beautiful do files or beautiful R scripts because they're good programmers, they're very serious researchers. For them, it might just be a small step from keeping this private to making this public. So for them, it may not be a huge amount of work. Certainly, anyone just starting, well, yeah, just start from tomorrow on your next project. Or well, tomorrow, Sunday, Monday, maybe, on your next project. Yeah, just start doing it and see what happens. Yeah. Um, 
can we teach old dogs new tricks? Well, we've got some old dogs in the, this room who have learnt new tricks, myself included probably, but can we do it more generally? And that's just a more sort of discussion point. Um, and then finally, yeah, Jeremy said about um, our, our inner economist. I had incentives on the slide, but then after that I thought about this, and then I thought right back to the hackathon. And I can genuinely say, on, in this example, in this situation, we did it because we wanted to. We really thought this was a good idea and we wanted to do it. There was no extra incentive for us at all. So I think, yeah, he's right. Maybe we do get bound up in this, this problem of incentives too much. Um, I'm going to come to an end. Um, and the final question is, would we do it again? Well, yeah, of course we would. And here it is. So am I on time? And Yeah, I'm happy to... Oh, okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, this is terrific, and you mentioned peer review, and I'm really interested in that topic. It, Incidentally, also came up a lot as a question for our kind of annotation project. So uh, can we expect peer reviewers to look at it? Should we expect peer reviewers to look at it? Should peer reviewers even see it? Will they be deterred from doing more peer reviews if they get this massive amount of information that they kind of feel they're responsible for? Um, I don't think that's anything against doing what you do in any case, but I'm really interested in what we expect the peer review process to do with this type of information. Yeah, it's hard to know. A, a few kind of really strange things have happened in the last couple of years, really, from about 2016. Um, some PhD students, you, I used to get a situation where PhD students would quite often come to a supervision meeting and they, you know, they flip up their laptop um, and you know, they, they would have their do file there or whatever. But I've noticed that quite often people will say now they'll be sending a chunk of a chapter or something, and they'll send it sort of two weeks in advance or a week in advance. But quite often they'll put a link to, you know, to their GitHub, and they'll suddenly have a Jupyter Notebook on GitHub, and they'll say, I'm worried about model 14, the code is in these cells. And they're actually directing me to really kind of dive in in a way that I probably, you know, didn't before or wouldn't as routinely. So I think maybe there's a sort of cultural shift in this. But I think also, you know, how many, I just wonder how many times I've reviewed a paper and just gone over the same sentence 20 times to try and work out what it is, or, or really looked at the table. To think, I cannot understand how the deviance in that model could be that. I just don't, I don't you know, and you know, what do you do? Do you, you know, it depends what you do. You know, do you reject, do you make a note of it, do you ask the kind of authors, is there a back and forth with the general? So I think already um, th there are problems with, you know, there are difficulties with peer review. And, you know, uh, clearly there's, you know, I'm not a fool. I, you know, I believe that some people just click and say accept or click and reject and they say they're anodyne comments and they haven't really put much effort into reviewing. But I think this is a real, you know, this could be the sort of turning of a tide, really. So, yeah, I think it's a good thing. Please. Sorry. So the American Journal of Political Science, they submit the the um, code and then another group tests the code. So it wouldn't necessarily be completely onerous upon the single peer reviewer. Although we did have one of our reviewers did look in very detail at all our code and comment in a lot of detail, which was nice. Hi, this is a, a little bit of an in the weeds question, but I, I don't think it's it's too much. So, um, we, so I, I've used uh, Jupyter notebooks with Stata and I to do we do some core reviews of the general social survey of different yeah. sorts of items and to see if they work well, um, and and it's really great. Um, but I was wondering how you so I can create this nice code that anybody can look at yeah. and, and they can rerun the cells and get the results and the issue that I, I run into is is that very first getting the data into Jupyter Notebooks for a person, right? And I was wondering how you did that in this project. That is to say that for GSS, there's not really a good answer because if I create a web link to the data, then it's like the GSS has to download each, so there's all these sorts of different things. I was wondering how 
did you did you just have a dedicated path so that the person? Well, I would ask how how did you how did the data get into Jupyter Notebook uh, for you to then use it? Right. Okay. Yeah. This this is a this is a sort of um, interesting issue. Um, if I was being absolutely honest, um, I think there's a there is a very difficult startup cost to using Jupyter, and a lot of uh, people, including the Jupyter team, don't believe you. Yeah. And it's easy to hit Anaconda and download, but as soon as you go, you start trying to work with it. There, there are some some issues, and they sometimes are a bit fiddly to to uh, to, to kind of resolve. Um, the different software works either by kernels or magic cells, and in this work we use partly the original kernel, but also the magic cells. But uh, another kernel has been written recently, uh, which I don't have today, but I think Roxanne's got on the machine. Who wrote the new one? Kyle Barry. Oh, Baron. Yeah, so there's a, a, there's a new kernel. Um, one of the problems is, as Jeremy suggests, if the, the data are not open access. Uh, so all we do here is link to the UK Data Archive because that, these data are protected. So the person has to register and download their own version. Um, but once they've downloaded, they can do everything. Um, so the data, so there's no release of data because these data are actually behind the UK Access uh, firewall. In this case, but, but we also share sorry. our file directory structure at the start of the notebook so that if someone just had that folder, then they could call upon the same folder throughout the notebook. Thanks for the presentation. It's, uh, I think, the first time that I saw this in a social science context, so it's very exciting. Just one comment, maybe. So, this was my experience when we once shared code, so not all the code, but just the coding that we consolidated. Uh, then we got comments that the code was not efficient or nice. So it, it worked, but it was not efficient from a programming point, point of view, and it was held against us. So I mean, if you do this, I, mean, I think it's a legitimate question not to ask. So what should the redu reviewers do with uh, about 17,000 lines of code? I look, just look it up on GitHub. Um, but then the at least editor should also make sure that it's, if the code is working but not nice, then it should not be held against the authors. Yeah, I agree. This is a sort of, um, I think, well, uh, J. Scott Long, I think, makes a very useful comment. He sometimes says that uh, there's a trade-off. You sometimes see PhD students write fantastically clever loops, for example. And then when you look at them, you can't understand what they've done. And you think, well, is it more efficient well, yeah, it does it in one pass. But if you'd have written 10 lines out, I'd be able to see them. Um, but clearly, this is not a problem in music. You know, when people go and get, go to the music library and get some Beethoven out, and they're able to kind of, their orchestra's able to play it, yeah? So clearly, if you think about it as a music analogy, there must be some ways in which, but of course, you know, compose, uh, uh, conductors, kind of reorchestrate music all the time, don't they? So I think it's that's, that's the sort of thing. You kind of really want to think really hard about what it is, what you've done, and how you communicate it. But you know, I think also efficiency is a red herring. Um, uh, Philip Stark, who I know very well, uh, I was chatting to him in the summer. I was in, uh, visiting. And uh, I said to him, I was trying to do some stuff in Julia. And he said, the great thing about Julia is that you'll be able to paralyze, parallelize some of your analysis. And I said, Philip, the one thing in my workflow that slows me down is not how quickly I can paralyze, paralyze a piece of analysis. You know, there's 101 things up until then that are really the inefficient bit, yeah? So I think kind of efficiency is, is a kind of red herring, because quite often we, we run something, we do something that's inefficient, what does it do? Does it take an hour more on our computer? Or? 20 minutes, but anyway, it's, I think it's a, a very good point, but maybe we can, we can start to, to think about that sort of communication in terms of, you know, you know, really what it is we're trying to communicate and how best we can, uh, others, others can understand that communication. Uh, speaking of cultural change, so if you switch the roles to be a reviewer, to what extent would you expect the same transparency from other papers when you are the reviewer? Um, I'm trying not to be a religious zealot. <laughs> I know this can be done, and I, I think there are benefits to it. Um, there are people uh, who have said after a certain time they're not going to review anything that's not transparent. I, I, I've not 
taken that step. I don't know about Roxanne, I've not taken that step. But I would encourage people to, to move as much as you can in this direction. Um, yeah, and I think, and I think that maybe, we, you know, it's probably more of a chat down the pub, but we did, we did talk about badges. You know, maybe there could be a badge that the reviewer, you know, here's my badge to say that, yes, I've run that guy's all, you know, and it could be red, amber, and green, you know, whereas green, I've run all the code and it works. Amber, I've taken a good look at it. And red, you know, it wasn't available or something. Yeah, so they could, we could maybe even move into, into that sort of uh, zone, perhaps. Hi, very, very interesting, wonderful. Um, I just, on, on the point of badges, the um, Association of Computing Machinery, I think is what they're called, ACM, Computer Science, they have badges exactly for that. Right. Oh. So that's something to look at. Yeah, and so I, I know there's a few other organizations that are working on it, but, um, and they have these kind of gradations as well as to how, you know, how much is available and how much is reproduced. Okay, thank you. It was a very interesting uh, presentation. Uh, I want to ask you, uh, does the, uh, do the children with uh, under average abilities have prejudice in the schools? And uh, uh, which is the measures uh, that schools offer uh, about these children? Uh, how, uh, how support the children schools with under uh, average of abilities? Yeah. Because uh, in Britain state, mm -hmm. because uh, in Macedonia or Balkan states, when I come, uh, uh, we can speak about this uh, supporting to children. They are different of, of theirs. Yeah, thanks. I so think, uh, sorry for my difficult speaking English, but okay. I think no, you no, understand no, no. me. No, no, I'm, you. I'm thrown on the back foot because it's actually about the research now <laughs> rather than the method. Uh, yeah, this, it, it, it wasn't a policy paper. The data are quite old. The first cohort were born in 1958, the second cohort were born in 1970. And one of the reasons why uh, we looked at these data is because they are under-analyzed and indeed unanalyzed in this area. Uh, so oh, these kids are now sort of quite old adults. Um, but um, it's not a policy paper, it was just more like, you know, it's actually a straight science paper really. Um, and these are the sort of big three institutional classes. And these are the sort of eight um, uh, individual classes. These are sort of more professionals up here and these are kind of more white collar workers. Uh, or sort of blue collar and work class uh, there. So I can't actually answer your question, but I can send you a reprint of the paper if you're interested. So thank you also for the talk. I have an, another question. Yeah. Um, I've seen kind of the additional files um, with the in your um, paper, which is just published. Yeah. Um, so the publisher has just uh, put them kind of at the very end. Yeah. And you can just download them. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the GitHub link is, is not given there, so kind it's of the, the... The GitHub link's in the paper. It's in the paper, yeah. okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but still, I, I would like to know, is this kind of the best they can do to integrate these additional files, or would you wish for something more? And what would this something more maybe be? Would I wish for something more? Um, I'm, yeah, I don't know what you wish. I think we kind of... Uh, I think I'm still slightly amazed that we got this far. <laughs> That's why, to be absolutely honest, so to, to write a whole paper with the Jupyter Notebook seemed, at the hackathon, it seemed quite a, uh, you know, on the far horizons, it was an aspiration. Um, and in my life, at least, for only a very small number of aspirations have actually come to fruition. So, um, yeah, so there's some surprise. But yeah, the, um, in British sociology, at least, people using GitHub is a kind of big step. Um, you know, I guess 95% of people don't use GitHub at all. Um, we've got you know, up at uh, OSF as well, and uh, I think it's in the gallery of interesting Jupyter notebooks as well, if you're in the, on the Jupyter site. Um, so yeah, maybe in future there'll be sort of, um, yeah, there'll be a sort of um, other ways of, of kind of popularizing this, but I think this is probably about as far as we can manage at the moment. I think, oh, sorry. sorry. Yeah. As, as a starting point, we, we didn't really even, sorry, we didn't even really know whether a mainstream sociology journal would even accept this. And we had to have lots of discussions about whether they would even publish the Jupyter Notebook. So even though it's not, you know, it's not up there as a dynamic document in itself, it's, it's a little step forward. Yeah. 
Yeah. Oh, yeah. Actually, more like a comment regarding what could also be done because I recently saw it's not exactly related to uh, Jupyter Notebook, but there's the software called uh, Code Ocean, where you can also use uh, all kinds of different programming languages and then um, run it in the cloud. Even like when you don't have Stata, you can still run the Stata code online, which is pretty nice. But what I also saw recently now that there have that they have collaborations with um, Cambridge University Press and Political Science Review Methods, I think it's uh, what the co journal is called. And so what they allow you is to have the code right in the journal article itself so that you read the empirical analysis and then you see, ah, okay, this is now the code embedded and you can run it in the article. Thank you. Code Ocean. So according to the schedule, we still have about five minutes. If, if there. Ah, okay. Okay, please, please do. But, yeah. Five minutes, and yeah. since you mentioned uh, Scott Long talking about a graduate student who writes convoluted loops, I believe I was the, he said that for a long time because I believe I was the original graduate student who wrote convoluted right. loops. And I've learned uh, in the time since then, and it, 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 uh, it ties to what you were talking about in your talk about uh, literate programming. Mm -hmm. um, because I think an important dimension of literate programming, which I've become an almost radical convert to over time, because it helps me remember what it is I was doing and what those loops are about, is, is the idea within that of self-documenting code, right? So, so old me used to think that I'll have big comment sections or comments throughout yeah. where I explain what it is that I was doing. I was almost writing code twice, some kind of verbal thing and then, and then the actual code. And what I have, have really moved to, uh, and it's been so much more helpful, especially with things that are, end up being complicated, is trying as much as possible to have things I define in the code work for me. The most obvious things, if you're a Stata user, um, would be uh, the names I give to macros and other things in the code, rather than just using a little shorthand that made sense to me at the time, trying without being excessive to have macro names that are 14 or 16 letters long or something like that, that really explains yeah. what it is. Uh, doing the same thing with variable names, you don't wanna get carried away with it, but having it be things that you understand, you do have to type more, while you're doing it, but especially now that we can all type, you know, we can type pretty fast. That that is just a trivial cost compared to the cognitive benefits later on of looking at your code and being able to follow it. Mm -hmm. Cannot recommend it highly enough. Yeah. yeah I could say even one thing myself. Yeah, please. Uh, say, yeah. That um, this brings up a thing I think for software developers. Are there any watching? Um, that if if the if when we ran our code, if it could output alongside it something like what you described, you know, like for, for example, ML Win users know that you're looking at the exact equation always. So you really like, yeah. this is it, this is what's happening. Yeah. So it would be pretty cool if our, if our um, coding programs could output something similar that records all of that, just an idea. Yeah, so. Any last questions? Otherwise, I think we can just move directly on to the next talk. So thank you, thank you for your talk.